Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me on today's episode of Carol PMC's video interview series. I'm excited to have you with me today to discuss another's journey through medicine. And today I have an amazing guest speaker for you all, Dr. Christine Cole Morgan. Our distinguished Sergeant of Arms got me in contact with her and she is one of the most amazing physicians I've ever spoken to in my entire life. She provides excellent insight into the fields of surgery involving colon, rectal, and endocrine surgery, as well as breast onco oncology as well. She was born and raised in the greater Boston area and moved to Eugene, Oregon in 1998 with her family. Since then, her interest and infatuation with the sea and with facing challenge really provided a very unique and interesting foundation for her to explore and eventually get into surgery and become a surgeon. She's worked in the in some of the highest medical institutions there are, such as the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and she's volunteered plenty of her time in areas like Guatemala and Haiti on medical mission trips. She is absolutely amazing and sheds insight and quotes and knowledge about the field and about just life in general and honestly every single question that I ask her. And so I know I timestamp these videos, but for this one you guys, I really I really encourage you guys to just watch it straight through. So, let's go ahead and say hello to Dr. Christine Cole Morgan. Well, Dr. Christine Cole Morgan, welcome to Carol PMC's video interview series. It's great to have you with us today. Likewise, nice to be here. When did you realize you wanted to become a physician? I think when I was about 13. Really? What's I, um, good at 13? <laughs> the reason why I know that is because um, one of my uh, school projects when I was 13 was to write my own obituary. Wow. And so we had to... Um, Kind of write what our life looked like and in that obituary I had mentioned that um, I had become a physician. Um, I must have been slightly aspirational because I was also had won a Nobel Prize for the viral theory of cancer. Um, I had become chief of surgery at Mass General Hospital. I had three kids and I had retired on the island of Bermuda. <laughs> So go figure. Isn't that funny? Very specific as well. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know all this. I had to read this, you know, piece of paper that I found in old school. You know, you know when your mom sends that trunk, okay, honey, you're out of the house. Here's your trunk of stuff. And it was in that. So um, obviously from an early age, I guess. But I didn't have any physicians in my family, so I have no idea why. I was, I was going to inquire about that. Where did you grow up, first of all, and, it, and yeah. what maybe sparked those ideas? Yeah, I grew up in a, sort of a middle-of-the-road town in Massachusetts, about an hour outside of Boston, called Westboro. Uh, my mom was a school teacher, and she was a, um, a science teacher, so I probably had a fair amount of scientific interest from my mom. I think she probably would have been a physician had she grown up in a different time. You know, it was, it was remarkable just to have a job, I think, as a, as a woman in, in those days. Um, you know, I was born in 1965, so when I was 13, that was in the, you know, late 70s. Um, so I was kind of, we were sort of born equal. You know, I didn't have a big issue one way or the other. I, I, um, I'm going to just close this door. Hold on a second. No problem. The, uh, the interesting piece you guys don't get is that this whole sort of female empowerment thing has came about sort of in the third and fourth waves. Um, I, I, like I said, I, I just I, I felt born equal. I didn't really feel like I couldn't do anything, you know, as a woman. Or, and I never really thought about it. And to be honest with you, my my experience all through my education, we, I just, I'm sure there were 
biases here and there, but I didn't really, I wasn't damaged by any of them, <laughs> just because I think all people are biased in one way or the other about all kinds of things. And it wasn't until recently that I guess it was hard being a female and a physician, but I, I didn't experience any of that. I'm 55 years old. So in any event, um, like I said, I just was, I was going to be whatever I wanted to be. I didn't, have, I didn't feel like I had any barriers. So I was very blessed that way. In your facts page on the Oregon Surgical, um, on the website, you said that you learned most of your life lessons from your loving parents and the sea. Those two things. Yeah. So I was wondering what did each of those two parties teach you that is fundamental to who you are today? Oh, good question. Very good homework doing. I'm impressed. <laughs> you did your research. Very good. <laughs> um, well, I think the uh, ever quest to keep learning was for both my parents. Like I said, they were both teachers and um, and really they were leader teachers. They, my mom became a principal. My dad was a assistant superintendent of schools. Um, and they were, they definitely instilled the value of education in my mind from a very early age. And so just to always question, always learn, always seek out knowledge. That was just sort of second nature to be intellectually curious. They were both intellectually curious. And so I think I just, I grew up that way and I got that from them. The other piece about the ocean is, um, you know, I spent all my summers on a sailboat uh, growing up. We sailed all over the East Coast, um, did a, a Newport to Bermuda race when I was a little kid and um, did a fair amount of off, offshore sailing. And the ocean's so unpredictable and so awesome and you realize that you're really just a little piece of a much bigger puzzle that you don't necessarily have control over. And um, the ocean also taught me to read my surroundings, read the little details, and focus on the details because um, they're important. And when all the other stuff is tuned out and it's just you on a boat with the wind and the ocean, it's much easier to focus on, on those details. So I think that kind of training was, you know, both the quest for learning to be a, a learning environment plus a focus on the details kind of a person and then all, also kind of strategize about how you're going to get from one place to another. All those played uh, nice roles in, you know, certainly being a surgeon because a surgeon is really just solving a problem one piece at a time and then using a skill set, you know, to help the problem move along. It's very interesting that you speak to the role that self-reliance played uh, while you were out in the sea and how it helped you become a surgeon at first day. And for many of us here at Carroll College, experiences during undergrad years have been instrumental to who we are and where we're headed. You received your Bachelor's of Arts in Biology at Dartmouth College, I believe, in New Hampshire, where a core value in Dartmouth is encouraging a culture of integrity, self-reliance, and collegiality amongst faculty, staff, and students. And so I'm curious what your undergraduate years taught you. Oh, that's another good question. Well, I loved my undergraduate experience. In fact, um, to this day, I still get together with 13 other uh, Dartmouth women. Um, and we meet once a weekend, one weekend a year, excuse me. Um, we've been doing that now for almost 20 years, um, seeing each other, you know, there's been breast cancer, there's been divorce, there's been sickness, there's been kids, college, the whole thing. And um, so I made some pretty strong bonds of friendship there. Um, it is a little place out in the middle of the woods, probably not uh, much unlike Carol. You know, you're, you're not in a big city town. You're, it's cold in the winter. It's, um, you know, there's, you're out there, you know, and, and that's what Dartmouth was like. So you kind of had to learn how to fend for yourself and not have all the comforts of home immediately available. It's not like you can just jump on a plane right outside of Carroll and be home. You know, it's, it's a journey to get to Carroll. And so um, I think that experience was great. I would say those values were still the values back then. You know, we, we had those similar similar values, but I had a, we had a really amazing dean of students 
her name was Dean Bonds, and the fact that I still remember her this many years later, at Convocation, she really laid out goals for us and basically said, you know, go out and become a positive and significant influence on your surroundings. That's your job. Like you get to come here, you're going to learn, but then you're going to take what you learn to go become a positive and significant influence, you know, that she said on society, but I think society can be your local community, it can be global, it can be regional, just on your surroundings. And um, I don't know, it must have been the way she said it. I really, we all kind of took it to heart. I, I felt like I had a noble cause coming out of there. I had to do something positive. I could not just sit back. I had to create and, and be positive. So I, I think it's the people that you meet along the way, really. It's not necessarily the place and we, I just, once again, was extremely blessed in my education that way. Yeah, it's very beautifully put. And we're still generalized, too, because these are life lessons that probably anybody of any vocation could, could take into their practice. And I know you had specified that at 13, you had known that you were going to be a doctor. So were there any experiences at Dartmouth that helped develop you or um, shine light into what type of doctor maybe you wanted to be? or certify what medical school you wanted to go to, um, anything medicine related? Um, you know, I did get a chance to do some um, research at the Dartmouth, what is now Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. They didn't even have that back then. Um, and I got to do some bench top research and, and had some uh, uh, PhD type phys doctors who were uh, def definite mentors. Um, but honestly, I think it was my friends who were also doing and pursuing their goals. For example, one of my, um, one of my other friends became a physician. Um, another one became, uh, she was a math major and then she ended up going into business and went to Tuck School of Business. They were all doing different, we had a couple folks that became lawyers. I had some, um, one that was a writer. And we were all just pursuing our goals. So we, we were goal oriented people and just, I would say just supportive of each other's goals. So I don't think there was a specific professor or mentor that was older than me that led me to become a physician. I think I kind of already knew that's what I wanted to do. I, I was just one of those lucky people who knew what I wanted to do early, earlier on. So let's fast forward then to you enrolling at Boston University School of Medicine. What do you think was your most important experience while as a medical student? Ah, this will come as a surprise. Um, and it's right on the top of my mind, so I'm glad you asked. So, I, my parents were teachers. Boston University was relatively expensive. Of course, I had student loans for medical school, as most everyone does. And, um, I had to work, you know, I, I had to have some spending money. So in the summers, I would, um, I was a phlebotomist, but then during the day, but by late afternoon and night, I was actually a waitress. And um, there were two, I part-time waitress in, um, it was a cocktail bar called the Roxy and it was crazy big band experience on the hour and then regular disco um, on the off hour. And all these yuppies would come and um, drink a lot. And I learned the crowd pretty quickly that if you could work the crowd, you can make a lot of money. <laughs> and so I learned people um, as a cocktail waitress. And alcohol, of course, was the great lubricant. And so everyone was always having fun. And there was something unbelievably satisfying about leaving with a bag of money. Like, because it, it was tips. You would literally leave with a bag of money. And so the better I was at interacting with the people, the more money I would make. And, it, and it, the more drinks I could memorize at a time. And I could memorize about eight or nine drinks at a table without writing anything down. 
the more money I was going to make because I would just go around and I would me remember it by the, the table and I'd go to the bartender and he'd make my drinks and I'd whip them out. And so um, not very noble, but it was a good people person experience. So that was, that was sort of number one. Number two, the other w place I waitressed was in a back bay kind of snooty cafe and lattes were just coming out. Think of that like no one had a latte we had this latte machine and everyone wanted a latte and i remember it was a brunch and i couldn't keep up i was trying to make the lattes and the food was coming out and the everyone there was dissatisfied and i i just was not having a good brunch and um i had many tables that were not happy with me because of course it's always the waitress fault when the food doesn't come out on time and i remember thinking my god if I can't be a waitress, how am I ever going to be able to be a doctor? And so it was just super humbling. It was just like a humbling experience. And so those were two, the two sort of empowering, pivotal times of, believe it or not, med school. And med school was hard. I was just like, open your book, study, grind, do the best you can on the tests, learn as much as you can. But in terms of like personal character building experiences, those two by far built more character. Who who knew, right? Wow, there's so much to unpack in that, let alone the fact that you were working while, I mean, it was during the summer in between semesters of medical school, but that alone, I mean, that's 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 crazy that you were able to, to do those things as well in addition to the didactics and the rotations that um, that you had in, in medical school as well in those semesters. Um, but it's, it's I, I completely get what you're getting at. Um, when I was at the University of Colorado, Hansen's Medical Center, uh, doing this pre-medical program, I met a doctor named Dr. Elaine Reno, and she was a cocktail waitress before getting into medicine. And she spoke volumes about how people interaction, the different people you interact with, and especially with alcohol involved, that helped her for her job in the emergency department as an emergency medicine physician now. It That's so like, cool. Yeah, it sounds like you you might belong in emergency medicine, at least at this point, at least at where we're at. Did you ever, were you ever interested in, in emergency medicine where you're kind of going around to patient rooms just like a waitress to different tables? I thought about, I thought about emergency medicine for a while. I did, yeah. Um, and I, I decided against it, um, you know, from a lifestyle standpoint, great, great career. Um, because you can turn it on and turn it off, but I needed to be, um, I needed to develop a more enriching one-on-one -on -one with a patient to satisfy me for whatever reason. I mean, the excitement of ER medicine is crazy cool, but I, it didn't suit my ultimate needs. Yeah. That's very interesting, and that's that's great that you're able to draw that from the the, those experiences as a waitress, because I think it's the same message for us today as pre-meds, looking at not just clinical experiences to build us into who we are, but also the non-clinical experiences as well. Um, I think it's interesting, uh, another choice in life, um, besides be heard to surgeon, would be physician to surgeon. I think that's a big, that's something that a lot of medical students say you should know prior to getting into medical school. And so I'm curious what you think somebody should think about, what should go into one's thought processes when deciding whether to become a physician or a surgeon? Yeah, that's a big long topic, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, so first off, um, I wasn't gonna be a surgeon. I'm probably one of the few surgeons, but there's a lesson in this story as well, that ended up in surgery by accident. So um, when I was at Dartmouth, I had a boyfriend, uh, we dated, we kept our relationship going all through med school. We ended up um, getting married. He was to, um, the plan was we were gonna go to Salt Lake City and do a residency. I was already matched in um, radiation oncology. I, I really had an affinity for on oncology and I had a mentor, um, I developed a, a female mentor from one of my away rotations at UCSF and I had matched and we were, it, my, my then husband's brother was at 
Salt Lake City, so it made sense. Long and short of it is, um, he didn't match there in urology. He matched at Mayo Clinic. And the only sort of immediate quick spot, this is crazy, that I could get was um, in surgery at Mayo and as a, you know, part of a pyramid program. I don't even know if they have pyramid programs now. So I did an internship in um, surgery at University of Iowa while he was finishing his med school. We were a year apart. And then we both moved together to Mayo where I convinced the surgery department to hire me. And if they didn't like me, they could just fire me. Um, and that was all to not... God forbid we take a year off and figure out what, you know, what we could do or I, you know, I, God forbid we were behind a year, you know, that I jumped off the trajectory. So rather than jumping off the trajectory, I switched careers altogether and became a surgeon. Unheard of, like no one does that anymore. But I mention it because it all worked out fine. I mean, I ended up loving surgery and love it to this day and can't imagine not being a surgeon, yet it was all by accident. So, you know, my dad always had a, a quote, he said, don't let your life be an accident. And I think that was his way of saying, you know, live an intentional life, do some planning ahead. But sometimes I argue back because sometimes things happen by accident for a reason and it's a better outcome and maybe it was something that was meant to be and maybe that sounds kind of romantic but I do think that you know not every single thing can be planned and strategized so you kind of need to strategize but you also have to have the flexibility of mind to know when externalities are upon you that you, you may need to be able to pivot while you're prioritizing what you want out of life. And that's hard to do at your age. I mean, it's really hard. But bottom line, the difference between surgery and medicine is, um, I think it's the commitment. I mean, let's face it, you go to the Air Force Academy and everyone wants to be a fighter pilot, right? But the bottom line is, are you gonna do a five and dive and oh five years or are you going to 10? A decade's a long time. So you gotta really want it. Um, it's gotta be one of the few things that make you happy at, at, at any given moment. And so I think most people would go into surgery because they know it's the only thing that's gonna make them happy. It's worth that, it's a decade. I mean, it's worth it. You've gotta master a craft that takes a long time to master. And um, it's more, I'm, my husband would probably kill me for saying this, but it's more stressful in certain ways to be a surgeon than it is um, not to be a surgeon. Uh, there's not that being a doctor is not stressful. There's all kinds of stress involved, but surgical stress is very acute stress. It's very now and acute. And uh, some people thrive in that environment, some people don't. Yeah, I'm interested to hear about that acute stress. So. So you completed your residency training in general surgery. Uh, you got a fellowship in laparoscopic research. There we go. And served as an associate professor of surgery all during your six years at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, which is a place that is world renowned as the best place for patients with the worst medical conditions. Now, with that all being said, and with the foreknowledge that you spoke about, hey, accept me, and if I'm not good enough, Fire me. Describe working and learning surgery in that environment. Yeah, well, it was definitely more um, harsh than it is now. Uh, just be fortunately, to be honest with you, I mean, again, happiness equals expectations met, right? So I didn't go in expecting to be treated extremely well. I mean, I knew I was going into a surgical profession. Most of the, again consultants is what they were called, um, were kind of crotchety men, you know, who were used to doing things their way. And we had to learn pretty quickly how to get things done the way they wanted things done. And if you didn't get them done right, you weren't treated with glee. And um, things that were said to me back then would never fly now. I mean, uh, one of the surgeons um, I used to keep 
the F word list in my inside of my locker and I would tick off how many times he said the F word to me. Um, and if I got over 10 during a case, I knew I had really screwed the case up. I mean, I just, that can't happen now, right? You know, it's just, it's, things like that, just people don't treat people that way anymore, fortunately. Having said that, we sort of expected to be treated that way, so we weren't damaged by it. And now, if you were treated that way, you would be damaged by it because we don't expect to be treated that way. So I think it's, you got to be a little careful when you compare things out of context. Um, socially, things were just very different than they are today. People are a lot more sensitive to words. They're a lot more sensitive to demeanor. They're a lot more sensitive energetically. And so when the receiver is more sensitive, the giver has to be more sensitive. And to be honest with you, it's probably a better outcome. Having said that, the way we were treated before, again, I'm not damaged goods because we were treated that way. We were sort of expecting it. It was really not that big of a deal. We weren't as sensitive. I'm just going to come out and say it. We just weren't. And so I don't think, I don't think that's good or bad. It's just different. And so I think it's, you got to be very careful when you compare past times to environments now. So it was a very, it was a pretty harsh environment. You didn't get a lot of kudos. We didn't get a lot of attaboys. You got a lot of criticism a lot of the time. But I will say, when you were being criticized, you never forgot that lesson. And so now I think we teach differently. But to get up in front, you know, Saturday morning, we would have something called um, M&M, um, Mortality and Morbidity Report, every Saturday you would present the case as if it was yours, even though your consultant was in, ultimately in charge. If something went wrong with the patient or there was a bad outcome, you were in front of a big crowd presenting the case and someone else in the crowd would raise their hand, another consultant, and be completely critical of you, even though you weren't ultimately responsible, it was your staff guy who was. And you had to stand, I mean, it, it was harsh. And you had to stand there and take harsh words in public. Can you imagine that? We can't even take harsh words on Twitter now. I mean, and it's not even in real time. And so, yeah, you you prepared for that M&M, but didn't mean that we weren't didn't go out drinking the night before, you know, and have a good time with your buddies. You know, you go out drinking or whatever with your buddies at Friday night, then you'd study for your cases for Saturday morning and get through it. And then afterwards, when you got you know, dissed up and down, you'd get back with your buddies and you'd go, can you believe, you know, Parallel said that to me in front of the crowd and you just got through it. So it, it's a different time, but it was, it was profoundly intense. And then we also didn't have, um, there was no limit on call. So nowadays the med students have, you know, they can't be working for longer than 12 hours, probably for a good reason, right? You're not as sharp 24 hours later. But we didn't have any of that. So, I mean, I was on call every third night forever. I mean, we were just, I didn't get any sleep. <laughs> we were just on call all the time. And we just got used to that. And then you took your weeks off of vacation and you had a good time. And you went back and you've been on call. And we did that for six years. So it was pretty crazy. Yeah, it's quite unique. And there's a lot to unpack with that. Um, I'm curious, uh, while we're on the topic of sleep deprivation, uh, were there any crazy stories related to that or any strategies to stay awake? I know a friend um, or somebody I knew said that if you can put coffee grounds in your eyelids and it'll hurt so much that you won't shut your eyes. Uh, I'm curious, no. are there any weird, interesting stories of sleep that Because what you said, I'm completely aware of how there weren't any of those laws. And the, the yeah, well. no, we there was no physical anything i mean we were uh, we were treated very respectfully from that standpoint um it was mostly um it was mostly mental uh more aggressive type communication that we just don't use anymore mm -hmm. people don't talk to each other the way we used to talk to each other back then or i should say the way we were talked to um, it was a very military style. I mean, it was there was definitely a, a military. Uh, there was a pecking order. There was a hierarchy. It was definitely command and control type 
hierarchy, unlike now where everyone's involved, everyone is the piece to the puzzle. They, you know, it's just more of a collaborative approach. There was no real collaborative approach. You just did what you were told. You, know, you learned a way, you did what you were told. You stayed out of trouble, you kept the patients alive, and you didn't complain. So you think back then to where it was maybe a little bit more of a harsher and not as collaborative environment as compared to now. Um, and I guess this is kind of speaking, or this is getting a little ahead into what your mentality might be as a professor then to your students, but as a medical student or resident to an attending or to a chief resident, how do you foster that collaboration? Does, it ha does everybody have to remain at like one sensitive level or is it good to have some diversity and maybe this one person's a little harsher, it's gonna bring harshness to the table. But then we have this other person on our team bring some sensitivity to the table. How do you foster that, the best collaboration nowadays in this collaborative, diverse environment? You know, um, I think you've seen my website. So, I mean, obviously we've had to adapt to a completely different society and environment. And, um, but I think the key lies in transparency because I think transparency is really a matter of trust. If you're transparent, you, I just think transparency fosters, fosters collaboration. If you're, if someone's being honest with you, um, you're going to, you're going to be able to say, Hey, this isn't, remember we agreed on this set of values and you're not really following this set of values. So can we realign? And you can be transparent with that person and it may not be what they want to hear, but there's a way to deliver that message that then brings folks back to the mission and value of whatever organization, whether it be your team on rounds or whether it's your company. I think if you spend time laying those ground world rules and transparency is one of your values, you're going to end up okay in allowing a diversity of thought. I do think quashing diversity of thought will be your generation's peril, personally. Um, I think diversity is awesome, but it can't be just diversity of background. I do think you have diversity of thought. If you don't allow diversity of thought, there will be a, there will be a, a pendulum swing because at the end of the day, you can't make someone think something they don't think. So if someone's being made to think something they don't think, they're still thinking it in here and they're gonna hold it in there and it's gonna come out in a bad way some, some other time. And so to preserve that diversity of thought on a team is, is just, in my opinion, just critical. And if you're transparent about that and people are encouraged, yes, your opinion might not be what my opinion is, but that's how the plane stays up in the air. You know, if the co-pilot's like, uh, there's a there, there's a, a mountain right there, we're going to hit it, but they're taught never to question what the pilot's seeing, you're going to bring the plane down. So, yeah, I mean, you've got to allow that. In my I'm opinion. devil's advocate for a second, because Please. what if I'm part of your team and I'm a physician and maybe I'm, I'm incorrect and maybe it would be best to foster collaboration and success for the team and for the patient if i was honest but i'm a doctor doctors are supposed to know everything we're supposed to be i'm i'm missing it, how, how do you battle with the the ideology that physicians should just be correct that residents should be correct we should know our stuff because that's that's what arguably the public opinion of a doctor is yeah, I think that that's a bad public opinion that needs to change. I mean, doctors are human and a doctor and a good team that your team's not all doctors. I mean, I have um, my scribe slash MA medical assistant. She's 24 years old. She does not have a full undergraduate degree yet, but she, her aptitude is off the chart. And I can't tell you how many times she saves my bacon. She picks up a detail that I didn't see. If I wasn't listening to her, I would be doomed. And it's the, the coolest thing because she um, she's actually a single mom. She works from home sometimes. I can hear her, her child in the background every once in a while. She's got her screen, which has all the medical record on it. 
she's on my phone. I have hearing aids because I'm a little deaf. So my nice little $6,000 Bose speakers are in my ear. I just bring my phone into the room. I set it on the table. She can hear the whole thing. She's got the whole medical record in front of me and she will um, give me breadcrumbs sometimes about what's going on with the patient or, if, or correct me when I'm wrong. And if I wasn't receptive to that, that that's, that's on me. You know, that's my problem. And so um, doctors aren't all knowing. I mean, we're good puzzle solvers, really good puzzle solvers. And we solve them one patient at a time. We're basically really fancy piecemeal laborers who solve puzzles. That's it. And at the end of the day, being a doctor is really just two people in a room talking, just like you and I are doing right now, and solving a health problem, which is a puzzle and putting all the little pieces and the data points together. And if you can't listen to your 24 year old MA help you do that, then you're gonna miss out. So your, your whole team is profoundly important. And so that, that is a wonderful um, evolution, so to speak, of where it once was, where you just, you know, do what you're told and, and let's be in this more top down command and control environment. You're gonna miss stuff in that environment. Um, so I, I love that evolution. Yeah, well said. And then let's speak to a different environment now. So you, in addition to Minnesota and your practice in Oregon, you care for patients in Guatemala and Haiti. And tell me about those experiences and having worked in one of the top medical institutions to some of them, um, to also some of the most medically underserved regions of the world. What lessons have you learned from that? Oh yeah, Th those missions are great. They're incredibly rejuvenating and um, uh, it's funny, my husband came with me on the last one. He didn't want to go um, and I actually, you know, Winnie's been on a few and so has Michael and um, I kind of started to whine at my husband and said, but Winnie's husband goes and their family goes and so he of course came along and it it was the coolest thing he's ever done. He said he, he absolutely loved it. And I think it's just because it's pure medicine. You know, all the other stuff is, it's just all of the barriers to care giving are gone. You know, you can just be pure about your caregiving. And, and of course the, the patients are, um, again, expectations, right? They're so happy just to have someone pay attention to them. Unlike here, it's, we get, we get plenty of attention here. So um, it's such a rewarding experience to do that. I mean, I, I don't even know how to describe it. Um, my son wrote an essay about his experience in Haiti because he came with me to Haiti. And he said, it's, you know, when you shine a flashlight outside in the light you can't see the light even though it's a very small light and bright when you're in the dark but if you shine it in, in the daytime you just don't see it down in Haiti everything is dark so you shine this little flashlight and it's just beams you know you can actually see your point of light so much easier there and so I didn't do a good job explaining it but that was his analogy and he's spot on. And that's exactly what it's like. Just the littlest thing is just like a ray of sunshine down there. And so, you know, it kind of reminds you there's little rays of light all, all around us. We just don't see them because we're always bright here, you know? So it makes you stop and appreciate the little things. And of course it wears off, you know, you, you come back with your post mission glow and then you get cynical about you know, three weeks later, but <laughs> it's still, it's pretty cool. It's a great, I highly recommend doing a mission if you ever had a chance. It's a very cool thing to do. I had a similar experience when I did a week-long mission trip in Mexico through Carroll College. It was that similar feeling, that, that glow, and that's great that you share that with your family as well, and um, you get the lay person too, not just the person who's interested in medicine, but also other people as well, to, to have that reminder. I think that's very important. Society. What part of Mexico were you in? We were in a small little town called Colón, uh, just outside of Quiretaro. Um, so it's about three hours from Mexico City. Um, 
but you weren't near the coast or anything. So we were we were in a pretty safe area. It was at an, an orphanage, um, and just a very very small town. Um, and the orphanage was quite interesting because while we cared for people in town and the kids, oftentimes uh, the U.S. definition of orphan didn't apply. Oftentimes there were kids there whose parents just couldn't afford to support them, and so they went there. So Carol's got that great opportunity. Once the COVID pandemic has lowered a bit, it'll be great to get more pre-med uh, and medicine-oriented students out there. But that's a great way to put what lesson you get from those experiences. That's awesome. Yeah. And shifting back now to the U.S., I'm curious about specifically your, your specific interests in surgery. So what excites you about surgery and the subspecialties of breast surgical oncology and endocrine surgery? Yeah, I think um, the breast surgery excites me just because the field of breast cancer treatment has changed so much over the last decade. And it's been very fun to be on a, um, you know, let's face it, a lot of money has been dumped into breast cancer. So it's been very innovative and a lot of things have changed over the years and how we treat breast cancer. So it's been very fun to be on that edge of education. You know, it's just constantly changing back to this, you know, you're not stagnant. Um, the second thing that I like about it is that um, you, it, it's a pretty intense time. It typically happens in women between the age of 45 and 65. They've got a lot of family issues um, that are happening during that time as well. There's a lot of transition going on. So it's really a privilege to be involved in people's lives at that time while they're in a crisis and to be a, um, you know, a, 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 a swallow, so to speak. You know, when the sailor was out at sea and he saw the swallow, guess what he knew? He's close to land. And so you know how sailors have the swallows on their, on their, their tattoos? That symbolizes, you know, how many times they were offshore. When you see a swallow, there's hope. You're like, sweet, I've got, I've got land is coming up. I'm going to be able to smell it pretty soon, even though I can't see it on the horizon. And so I kind of feel like we get to be swallows for these patients. Um, they're out in the middle of this ocean. They don't know what's going on. They've got breast cancer. And then to be able to say, oh, I tell this to my patients every time. It's a problem. We just need to solve it. It's a problem solving exercise. We'll solve your problem. And then I start telling them how we're going to do it. Totally rewarding. I mean, it's like you see the, the stress just like melt away just in the fact that they have a plan. So that I love. And then thyroid surgery is um, appeals to me because I was an only child. And so all the presents were mine at Christmas. And I love opening presents. And part of the fun of opening a present is you don't know what's inside, right? You don't just give someone a present without wrapping. you got to work for it, right? And so finding parathyroids and thyroids in this tiny little space in the neck, which is super elegantly designed by the creator, is the coolest thing in the world. I mean, it's like a treasure hunt to find the little thing. So it's the treasure hunt aspect of thyroid and endocrine surgery that I adore. So I get kind of the best of both worlds. I get to treasure hunt, and then I also get to be a swallow. I mean, that's pretty cool. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's very interestingly put. I love the meta uh, I love the metaphors. You can tell you've uh, been close to the sea before. Uh, it's very well put. Um, I'm curious, do you have a favorite surgical procedure at all? Yeah, probably a parathyroidectomy, which is, a, um, again, a real delicate procedure in the neck. And I like it because sometimes it takes a long, long time and you can't find what you're looking for. And other times you go in and you find it right away. So it's, it's the unpredictability of it that I, I really enjoy. Interesting. Never boring. I'm curious. So uh, as an associate professor, so what made you decide to serve as an associate pr professor of surgery at OHSU? Uh, and what are skills and qualities and mindsets of successful surgical medical students that pre-meds can begin to foster today to do well in that type of environment? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, one of the, one of the fun, I love interacting with um, students. Um, it reminds me of, you know, makes you feel younger because you remember what you were like as a student, which is that 
sort of everything's a wonder kind of thing. You're learning. And I think the day that I stop wanting to learn is going to be very sad. And so I just love the vibe of being around people who are learning. Having said that, we're not in an academic setting. We're not in an academic center. Um, and, and so it's a really nice way to be able to interact with students, um, yet work in a place like Eugene and not have to work in a city like Portland so, or a big place where there, it's an academic center. center. So that is the main reason. It keeps me sharp, keeps me learning. I have to be on my game. I can't just kind of show up to work and fall into the same routine. Um, in terms of the students that I know are going to do well, um, I'm trying to figure out how to describe it. Um, I really think it comes down to the art of being intellectually curious without being annoying. You know, I mean, you can just tell the person's curious, but they're not asking obligatory, obsequious questions. You know, they're not asking a question just for the sake of asking a question. They really do authentically want to understand it. And there's a difference. And I can smell it a mile away. Um, I think authenticity, being just an authentic human being, you're golden. Authentic and curious. Curious. That's it. You got those two things. You're gonna be a great. You'll be a great doctor because you obviously are smart enough to be there because you're there. So it's not about aptitude. I mean, you're, most everyone who's in med school has got aptitude. They could never get there without it. So then after that, it becomes like, wh what's your authentic reason for being there? Doesn't have to be right. It doesn't have to be a certain thing. You can be authentically there for a billion different reasons. Just be authentic. Be true to yourself. Know yourself for God's sakes. And then be open-minded and curious. You're, go you're golden. And then some people, you know, again, want to be surgeons, but they just don't have hands that are going to let them be surgeons because they're, they don't have that hand-eye coordination. I mean, we've got a, um, I had a scribe who then went on, on to be um, a physician assistant um, she's in school right now. She's come back to her shadow with us, and I've had her in the operating room. She also just happens to be a all-American gymnast. She's a, like, uh, it's unbelievable the difference. Like, her hands just work in the OR. Like, her hand-eye coordination is just there already. And so some people just have that. Um, some people don't have it and can train into it. I didn't have it naturally. I had to train into it. And then some people just are never going to be able to trade into it and it's the wrong thing. So you got to know yourself like, wow, my hands just don't work. Like it's not, it's taking me so long to do this that it's taking others that a shorter time. It's just not the right thing. It doesn't, it's not bad or good, but there's plenty of places for everybody regardless of your skill set. But I think those are the two main things, authentic and curious. I think the curious part uh, is Quite easy for for Carol premeds to have it once they're in college and the plethora of experiences is upon them. I thought, think we might struggle with authenticity a bit because I mean I'm a senior in college. I'm graduating in a few months. Uh, I came to college expecting to learn a lot about myself, and I think at the end of the the day, I I know a lot about who I'm not, but not a lot about not not as much about who I am as I'd like to. And I think a lot of us share that same sentiment. So how, what type of advice do you give to a Carol pre-med who is still young and is still discovering who they are? Uh, what advice or what things can they do to start to cultivate that and to get those successful skills that might make them, turn them into a great surgical uh, student one day? Yeah, I mean, gosh, you just said it though. You know a lot about what you, what you're not. I mean, that's, that's like over half the battle, you know, because that keeps you from using any energy to go down a place that's not you. As soon as you know that, it's like a guardrail goes up. Oh, I'm not that. So I'm staying here. And then it keeps funneling down and funneling down. And you learn, you can almost close your eyes and feel it. It's like, this is not feel good. If it doesn't feel good or sense good, whatever you are, a sensor or a feeler, you, don't waste a single moment in there. 
don't, don't, don't get out of there. And you'll eventually, I think everyone thinks it's some specific thing that they're meant to do because that's what the movies tell us nonstop. Like I said, I wasn't going to even be a surgeon. Um, I don't think you have to know the specifics. It's more the quality. It's the qualities that you're looking for and less the details. And the details all, they just unfold. I mean, wasn't it Quelo said, you know, the you eventually, you, you tell the universe what, what it is that you're, you're interested in and then all of a sudden everything conspires to make that happen. And it really does. Like it, it's, I don't even know how to describe it. It's kind of magic. You, I mean, Winnie and I talk about this all the time. We, we dreamed about having our own practice years ago and we talked about it and we threw it out there to the universe and now we have our own practice. And it, it's awesome. We love it. But who in their right mind would start a new practice in the middle of COVID in a time when all the doctors are becoming employed? No one's starting their own practice. It's all doable. And so I think it's more about you're kind of like a, a, a cell phone battery or a cell phone. When you got too many apps running at once, your phone's not going to work. You get tired, you run down, the battery runs out quicker. Go through there and go, what apps are in there that I just freaking never use? Why am I even on that app? That's just sucking my battery. Someone told me to be on that. It doesn't feel good to have that app. I don't use it. It doesn't make me feel good. It doesn't add to my day. It doesn't really do jack. Get it off of there. Knowing which apps to get rid of is literally half the battle. So you don't need to know which apps you love. You just need to know the ones you hate. The rest of it all falls together. Literally, it is a immutable process. You don't have to do anything for that to happen. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, it does. It's it's along the same plane of maximizing utility and practicality in life. I think it's something that pretty much struggle with because hey, you need there's a there's a checklist, right? You need clinical experiences, right. non clinical. You need a good MCAT. You got need GPA. You got shadowing, volunteering. The list goes on and on, and so I think it's easy to download a lot of apps to extend your metaphor. <laughs> I feel bad for you guys. I think it, I don't know, honestly, I don't know how you guys do it because there's so much information. It's so competitive. There's clearly a lot of gamesmanship that you have to, hoops that you've got to jump through that, you know, you got to hold your nose to get through it. You know, it's just part of the gig. So it's got to be very difficult to know which are the things that I've got to just get done because I, I have my eye on the prize and which are the things that matter to me the most. And I, I, my heart goes out to you because I think it'd be very, I think it's got to be very challenging. Um, but I guess I would say don't add to the burden of that by worrying about every little thing all the time because so much of it just falls into place um, as you're, as you're you kind of need to, you kind of need to learn how to live, you know, while you're living, <laughs> you know, it's really impossible to learn the whole thing without living. And so while you're living, you're making mistakes, you're wasting battery, you're throwing apps out, you're getting new ones. And that's all part of the gig. It's okay. Yeah. And at the end of the day, people do it. Every cycle happens. Students get into medical school, it, it goes on. I think being authentic is one of the best ways to do it. I'm in full agreement with you on that. Um, as we near the end of our conversation, I'd like to go to another, uh, there's a lot of stereotypes surrounding surgeons, and so I'd like to, to touch on another one. I'm speaking to universality and throwing things out to the universe. Uh, regarding the difference between God and a surgeon, a lot of people say that God doesn't think that he's a surgeon. And so the stereotype of surgeons being arrogant, and overconfident, and mean, it's highly prevalent amongst medical student blogs and memes and social media outlets. Do you find this stereotype to be common? And if so, how may current and future generations overcome this stereotype? Yes, I think the stereotype, you know, all, let's face it, all stereotypes are based on some set of realities. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a stereotype, right? How, how did it get there? 
um, you got to be careful not to overjudge or prejudge everybody, but um, there's a lot of arrogant surgeons. Arrogance, as you know, is a um, counterbalance to deep insecurity, and the cure for insecurity is humility. And so humility is how you counterbalance that. You need to study what humility actually is. There's a lot of, lot of bodies of work on humility, both, you know, in the Bible and, and in philosophy and every, you know, you can find a lot about humility. So I'll tell you a quick story, which is my humility moment. I used to do pediatric surgery. Um, I was operating on a little baby um, and we were about 20 minutes into the case and the baby's heart stopped beating. Um, pressure went down and the baby was basically dying. There's no blood. I had put a something called a central line into the baby to give it, you know, fluids during the case. Uh, but nothing in the abdomen was a problem. Uh, so, of course, three alarm fire, bells and whistles, a couple anesthesiologists come in, we're doing CPR on the baby, and, you know, we're talking about a creature, you know, this big. And, um, we went down the algorithm, you know, like the plane's going down, you go through your checklist, the one that was beaten into you, and we really couldn't come up with anything other than something called cardiac tamponade, which means perhaps the central line had gone, busted a hole into the little beating heart, the fluid had gone into the sac around the heart, and now there was so much pressure in that sac that the heart couldn't beat. Well, the cure for that is to open the kid's chest up and get that fluid out of there. Well, that's great, but I'm not a cardiac surgeon and the kid's dying. And so we called the cardiac surgeon. He's on the golf course. There's no cardiac surgeon in the hospital at the moment. Um, so I had, and this was an out of body experience. I ran down, I scrubbed out while they were doing CPR. I ran down to the family to tell the family that things had gone horribly awry, ran, like physically ran, because we, we had minutes. And I said, listen, I'm gonna open this, your child's chest up. I have never done this before. It's a life-saving measure. The child could, he's been under CPR for a long time. She, she could end up having brain damage from this. Um, I'm assuming you want me to do that. I don't even know why I did that. Kind of crazy. They're like, oh my gosh, do whatever you gotta do. So I ran back up, I opened the chest. Sure enough, that was the diagnosis. I opened the pericardium, the fluid came out, the heart's just sitting there. It's the size of a walnut, it's a baby. So I took my thumb and I just started beat doing CPR, open CPR on the baby's heart. And I said, God, this is really up to you. This is not me. Like. This is all up to you. Please do not let this baby die. I cannot have a dead baby. These parents can't have a dead baby. You gotta help me out here. Sure enough, heartbeat comes back. Kids survives. We finish the surgery. I show the chest up. Um, fast forward, that was 20 years ago. I had a, um, an ER doctor who called me at like 11 o'clock at night. The kid had come in the ER she was alive and, you know, in college with a sprained ankle and he happened to read the op note and he's like, Jesus Christ, Chris, <laughs> what the hell is going on? I read your op note. I just wanted you to know she's awesome. You know, she's in at U of O and she's fine. <laughs> so that was humility. That was not me. That had nothing to do with me. I'm going to tell you that right now. I didn't know how to do that surgery. I was out of my league in the situation. That was something else. That was not me. And so there are no gods that are among, men are not gods. That doesn't exist. And so if you find humility, unfortunately, humans only find humility through pain most of the time. That's, that's the hero's journey, so to speak. Joseph Campbell has written quite a lot about that. I would suggest you all read some of that. That's how you prevent that. That's how you undo that stereotype. 
but you know what like i said it's tough to do because there's a lot of insecurity out there and for whatever reason i guess people have stopped reading philosophy i'm not sure why but there's some really great um life lessons in in philosophy that are worth pondering on a regular basis it's an amazing story um i i would be I, I wouldn't even know how to react and it, it, if you were in that ER in person and, and saw her um, doing live and well, um, that that is, it's quite, I'm, I'm at a loss of words as you can tell. That's I know. Quite a <laughs> experience. Um, it's the most amazing story I have and uh, I, I, I can feel the tension in my chest and that was 20 years ago. And so that is, like I said, that's, that's how I know, you know, every, and people ask me if I believe in God and I do. And I always tell that story and nothing, there's nothing that you could tell me that would unbelieve in God. That was not me. That wasn't me. So I think the sooner you learn that in life, the better. And, uh, and then it just opens up all kinds of possibilities in my mind, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I think being a pre-med, you feel, you feel a lot of place, you feel at the bottom of the totem pole, you feel quite young, but I think some of the best things that you can, best ways you can impact your life are at a young age, because that's what's going to hold and last for quite a while. And so I think we're at a very interesting point in our life. And I think, I wish well on that everyone who's a pre-med, from the freshman all the way up to the senior right now, because we're, we're at that point uh, we're at that transition point. Um, it's quite a unique, unique time. And thank you for that. I think um, your, that experience uh, is truly going to help motivate us. And I think it speaks to, you know, the, the ideology around surgeons and physicians and exactly how, why that's false, number one. And number two, why cognitive dissonance is so toxic and dangerous in the field of medicine. Yeah. Well, you guys, I applaud your efforts. It's hard being a pre-med. Um, there's a lot of other professions nowadays, of course, that make more money, that are, you know, richer, faster, better, more, et cetera, et cetera, in our society. But um, I think it's an amazing profession. I absolutely love what I do. Um, 24 years into it. Hopefully, I can continue to do it for a little bit longer, as long as my brain and hands work. And um, I applaud you guys. You know, you're going into medicine in a tough time. Um, it's harder than ever to go through the process. There's a lot of a lot of pressure on you, but um, it's worth it. And don't, don't if you find cynical people like that app that you need to swipe off, just swipe them off. You get away from you. You are, you are definitely the the average of the five people you hang out with the most. Get rid of the cynicism. Get rid of those people out of your life. Go back to people that are having helping you get to where you want to be. And with that, we end another episode of Carol PMC's video interview series. And wrap up another story for you guys. I know I usually highlight the some of the most best and significant takeaways from the interviews I do at this point in the video. Our, my conversation today with Dr. Christine Cole Morgan was absolutely amazing. I took away something from every single question <clears throat> that I asked that I asked her. Uh, and she's absolutely amazing. I think one of the biggest takeaways, if, if there is such a thing, was the part was her story about uh, the child that she was performing CPR to using just her, her thumb and the one that she cracked her chest, cracked the um, child's chest to to stop her uh, cardiac tamponade. I think that was an amazing story, and I think it spoke in a very interesting way to the idea of the surgeon stereotype, the idea of all of the idea ideology that encapsulates the career of a physician. I mean, there's arrogance, there's ignorance, there's prudence and there's harshness and there's there's overconfidence there's there's so many things that make up this this specific career yet we strive for it anyway and i think i think it really goes to show that despite the need to go through to kind of rummage through the weeds a little bit 
and take some blows to our ego and our pride. I think the pain that we undergo towards this path, no matter what happens, no matter how many years it takes, no matter what rejection you have, or no matter what befalls you in medical school or as a resident, or even as a physician, as, as we reach that goal and get that certification, I think she just she proved it's worth it. Simple as that. Simple as that stupid. The um the comment about humility I think was was quite amazing. Being that humility as humans we usually get our humility through pain. I resonate with that a lot. Um being from the experiences I've been through this and all of my years at Carroll um and I think I think it's something we can all take away. And by knowing that we all go through this same pain, I think instead of separating us, instead of keeping us in our own minds and our own thoughts, willowing in despair, I think it should bring us together. Because we're all on the same mission. We may share different paths, or we may be on different paths, but we're all on the same mission here. We're all going through the same pain and challenges. So why not work together? Thank you once again for joining me today, taking the time to listen and or watch me. Hopefully this helped you guys gain some motivation or insight into what it takes to become a successful pre-medical student. And as always, if you have any questions, please reach out to your Carroll PMC officers, schedule an office hour slot with myself on Moodle, or consult with Carroll faculty of your choosing. Have a great day, and I'll see you guys next time.